how can we animate a realistic human performance in a way that doesn't give us something that feels uncanny, that feels kind of wishy-washy and half alive. It takes a certain amount of skill and technical ability if you're gonna actually manually do it because there are tools to help bridge the gap. There's motion capture and various other things to help you speed up the process. You still have to clean it up. You still have to adjust it. You have to push and exaggerate and use those animation principles to actually bring some life to these characters. And that's the problem I wanted to solve with this video. Let's take a look. Ill news is an ill guest. Be silent. Keep your full tongue behind your teeth. I have not passed so far in death to bandy crooked words with a witless worm. Now it's not perfect, but I'm really happy with the results considering how much time I spent on the project. I'm gonna walk you through my full workflow, start to finish using this board, but if you want the nitty gritty, you want like the mini tutorials and the tips, I've written it all down. You can pause this video, you can use this as a resource. And if by the end of this, you really wanna learn like how I'm doing everything that I'm doing, take my class. I'm doing a whole Summer of Unreal learning event so you can jump in on one or both of the classes that I'm doing for animation in Unreal. Both are two weeks long, one's focused on character animation and the other one on cinematics and sequences. And they're modular, so you can pick the one you wanna take most or you get a discount if you take both of them. If you want to learn, I got you. Links in the description. Let's dive into this workflow. This is going to be one of the best things for those who don't do animation but want to have lip sync and dialogue in their shots. I went through and I found a whole bunch of different audio clips that I thought might be fun to animate. I wish I was the monster you think I am. Ride out with me. Ride out and meet them. Now for wrath. Now for ruin. And the wreck. And if you're familiar with Unreal, you might think that I used MetaHuman Animator to like capture my performance and then put it into the, the engine and like solve the face. I did not do that. I did not do it. I've done that in other videos and it's a great workflow, but it's not what I did here. I did use MetaHuman Animator, but not in the same way. You can plug in an audio source instead of a video depth source. So I found my clips, chopped them up, threw them into Unreal Engine and pretty much immediately solved them into this. You are a babbling fool, and we have built a temple to madness. I demand a trial by combat. I have not passed so far in death to bandy crooked words with a witless worm. I saved you. I saved this city and all your worthless lives. And I put these all on Instagram so people could vote on which one I was gonna work on. Lord of the Rings won, as it always should, and we move forward with Gandalf. Also a shout out to how quick it was to do all this stuff. Literally, I would just do this like I did any other normal task. <laughs> you have no power here, Gandalf the Grey. Next up was to actually create the character, figure out the reference of you know what I wanted to do and set up my shot. So I went to MetaHuman Animator, I blended a couple of sort of older characters together and I spent a lot of time trying to really tweak the character, make him feel more like Gandalf. I didn't want him to look like Sir Ian McKellen necessarily, but I definitely wanted that more gravelly, older man voice to come through. And this is where I started making really important decisions for the rest of this process. Sometimes working with MetaHumans as the blueprints that they are, they can get a little bit weird, they can get kind of buggy, and as you work with them, they're like disconnecting with a head and the body or like separating and things like that. I wanna deal with any of that. The most important thing for this step is really just looking at the original performance and trying to figure out exactly what I wanted to keep and what I wanted to change. The original performance, which I'll put on screen, is really subtle. He does so much with his eyes and his mouth and just like the sharpness of how he does certain words, but he hardly moves his head, he doesn't really move his body all that much. It's really subdued. That's where it starts to go into that uncanny valley because he's doing so much with so little and for me to copy that, it makes it seem like I'm not animating the character at all. So I decided to exaggerate. I decided to push certain things, but if you'll notice, the output of MetaHuman Animator, like the performance it's giving me, is already really big. There's these big mouth shapes, there's like a lot of facial stuff happening, and it's way more motion than the original performance. So I both have to dial it back, but also amp it up. But before we go forward, let's take a minute to thank the sponsors of this video, Dell and NVIDIA. I haven't showed you this on YouTube yet. I've showed you the laptop that I've worked with, the Dell Precision Mobile workstation, but this is the actual desktop computer that Dell sent me to make some projects on. This type of workstation has now been upgraded to the Dell Pro Max line. This is the most intense computer that I have ever seen in my life. Because as an example, mine here has the Ryzen Threadripper Pro, the 96 core, which makes literally everything that should take a really 
long time, not take any time at all. Half a terabyte of memory of RAM, which means that the only thing that'll ever stand up to this computer is probably After Effects. And in this workstation, I've got two NVIDIA RTX ADA 6000s, which are two enterprise level studio cards. But this computer was specifically built for me to push it as far as possible using projects in Unreal Engine and Houdini, which I haven't done on YouTube yet, but that'll come eventually. This is their new top of the line workstations for the era of AI. For 3D artists, that means neural shaders, that means mega geometry. There's a bunch of cool stuff that I've talked about in other videos. You can get up to 96 gigs of VRAM on those cards. It's wild. So. Thank you to Dell and NVIDIA for sponsoring this video. Let's jump back to the workflow. Step three is animation layers. And this was how I chose to go non-destructive and how to deal with all the keyframes. Because when you work with the MetaHuman animation tools, just like motion capture, it gives you keys on everything, on every frame. That's a lot of data. So let me give you some tips to make this process a little bit easier. First of all, you'll notice that I'm only working with the heads. I don't have the whole MetaHuman body. I mentioned earlier that MetaHumans are a little bit more complicated, that they're made of different parts. And to avoid any issues, this is what I meant. I We'll just drop in specifically the skeletal mesh head component. I don't drop in the whole character. And I'll just do the face on its own, and then I'll export that as an animation sequence. So real quick, I'm gonna give you some tips. This is what happens when you bring in the original data. So this is the animation sequence that came right out of MetaHuman Animator. And if I wanna just convert this to keyframe, what I do is I'll right click on here, I'll go to Baked Control Rig, and I'll throw this on the face control board and hit go. That will take all the animation and put it onto the face board where if I were to click all this, you can see lots of keyframes, right? All the stuff that we're talking about. And if you're an animator, you might wanna go in, take a specific control, go into the graph editor, and you can see that data represented here. But let me show you how layers work here. If I take a particular control, let's say this one that controls the jaw. If I click that control, it already has its own set of keyframe data that you know is doing its own thing. Now, especially for any non-animators, let me show you how this works. If I go to the top left corner, hit layers, it'll pull up the animation layers panel. And so if I select this controls and click new layers, it'll put this control into a new layer and I'll call this jaw. And so now this control has all of the original keyframe data still inside of the base animation layer track here, but I've created a new track without all that keyframe data. So if I were to just, for example, want to make a change to have this mouth pose open more, I could take this control, and with this layer selected, I'll set a key, and then I'll move forward a little bit. I'll set another key to a bookend and sort of preserve everything outside this range. And then here in the middle, I'll go ahead and push this and say, I want that to open more for some reason. Now what I've done, I can show you, this is the only animation data on this layer, just the jaw control doing these little keyframes. This is why I did the bookend, so I can preserve the original position. And now I have this new curve that represents my change. And so now, the jaw will open a little bit wider than it did before and go back to normal. And this entire adjustment, I could go through with this and I could make all my changes without having to deal with all the other data that was there before. And I can basically change all this as part of a layer. This layer itself can also be dialed down and adjusted and say, you know what, I don't want to see this at all. Let's go ahead and mute it. Or I can say, you know what, I only want 50% of my changes, for example. So you can actually change and keyframe all this kind of stuff and you can make adjustments in a layer without having to deal with the original data. Now that's just the concept of layers. Now let me show you one other thing that I think is gonna be really helpful. If we go to our character, we go down to our where our keyframe data is here on this face control board track, if we add a section, specifically this plus button, and we say additive, we basically create another animation layer. Now we didn't use the menu to do it, but it's going to allow us, let's go ahead and set a key. I like to start on the first frame. We'll go ahead and copy all this keyframe data. And we'll go here, select this, and we'll paste it. And what happens is, let me go ahead and do it one more time so you can really see it. If I add one more additive track, I'll set a first key, copy all the keyframe data from here, copy, and then paste. You might see what's happening. What I've done is I have multiplied the animation data by three by adding it on top of itself twice. If I pull up another copy of the original data, you'll be able to compare the two. And you can see that the one on the left is just a three times multiplied version of the original data because I've just stacked it on top of itself. People do this in games like Skyrim with mods and things like that. I can see a bit of what was and what will be. The reason I recommend doing this is because if you're not sure where to start or you're having a hard time sort of identifying any issues with the animation or figuring out what to clean up, first of all, it will act as a magnifying glass for any expression. If you're wondering like, oh, does it, is it anger? Is it sadness? What emotion 
is this. If you're not really sure, cause you're not used to doing face pose and stuff, this kind of shows you what this expression is if it were less subtle. This kind of is between sadness and anger. It's a little hard to tell, but when we blow it up to 300%, you can really tell it's kind of a, like a anguish, sad looking expression. It's not really angry, which is what I was originally going for. And this just kind of tells you some of the things that you can adjust. Or one of the things you'll notice if you look really close here in the middle of the brows, you'll start to see this bounce. See how vibrating it is? If I jump back here again, you can see how much this kind of shakes up and down. Boom, 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 boom. It's jumping around a lot more than I would like. You might not notice that in the original version. If you know what you're looking for now, you might see it. But if you wouldn't have caught that initially, because if I select these two controls, which control uh, that part of the brows, that's because of these little mountains going up and down, up and down but you might not have realized that that's what you wanted to set your attention on. So you can do this little trick and try to find the, you know, the first three things that jump out at you that you don't like. By the way, just to point it out, this entire block was a more complicated way to do exactly what I just showed you, but we can ignore this because this is way harder. The copy paste method much quicker. So this is useless. And a huge shout out to the Locodrome mat, which Anthony Coithra was so nice to build this for all of us to actually work with metahumans in a much easier way. It's a picker. I'm gonna have a link to the description below. Enjoy. Now this is the other animation layer thing I wanted to show you. Every one of these faces represents a different pass or a different animation layer of changes that I made to the original data. So this first one is what we got out of MetaHuman Animator. If I adjust my field of view here to make this a little bit more of a long lens situation. If we compare the left side, which is the original data, and the right side, which is my first pass of changes, you're gonna see that the main thing I did at the beginning was tone down how much general motion was happening throughout the face. On the left, the mouth is always kind of just dancing around whenever he's not actively talking, the mouth is still moving. See, he's not talking, but his mouth is still moving a lot. I didn't get rid of all of it, but you can see that I toned down how much general motion there is. Now, this is my final layer stack where each of these layers represents a different pass of what we're seeing here. So you can see the original data here, and then I adjusted it just to fix those motion issues. Then the next thing I worked on was the overall face pose to make him look angrier, more stern, and I started working on the neck, and so on and so on and so on and so on. So if I come through here, you can see that that face pose is there, and you can see that there's some neck motion. When he gets angry, you'll see these little neck tendons tighten up. And so that was the first thing I worked on. And so this is every major iteration of the performance that I worked on. And it was really easy to create this because I can just mute different layers and I can see what each of these passes does. Now here's where I broke things. In step five, I wanted to go beyond the control face board. I don't really like the face board for metahumans. Like it's powerful. It lets you grab these different parts of the face and move things around. And it activates various blend shapes to give you these different like face poses with these controls. I don't like working with it. I like to be able to grab individual controls and like move stuff. I want that cartoony feeling, that stylized animation feel of let me just get in there and put things where I wanna put them. That's not something you can just do with metahumans. And so, I called Anthony once again, and he helped me with something that's going to be released at some point as part of a set of tools called LocoFace. It is a custom control rig for whatever characters that will generate controls per bone. Metahumans have a lot of bones and joints and like stuff under the hood. And I, as the crazy person that I am, I want control over each individual one. Yes, it's kind of a pain in the butt because doing it this way, there are no limitations whatsoever as to what I can move, how far I can move it. And it becomes up to me then to do the actual work. But I wanted a way to push the expressions beyond what metahumans usually have. And I wanted something more custom, you know? I didn't want it to feel the wishy-washy way that sometimes metahumans will look without that proper attention and love and care. And then of course, arguably the most important thing about this entire metahuman process is the eyes. You can see here that when he said behind your teeth, I wanted him to look down a tiny bit. So he's kind of like looking at wherever the person's mouth is for behind your teeth. And then here I wanted him to like size him up and like look him up and down angrily. So I tried to put a little bit of eye darting looking up and down. So it's time to add the body in the environment. The body is where I had another shortcut. I actually did use motion capture. I also put the character in a big cathedral scene. I'm using the um, Obsidian pack, which I bought a while ago for some of these videos. But now I've broken some stuff because at this point he had said, keep your forked tongue behind your teeth, right? He had said that line and I had animated the eyes looking down. Well, now that the like head's moving around, that doesn't work. Now his eyes are just like locked to his head. And that's where we get the really bad metahuman like, Ah, the eyes are just like 
stuck to this doll. So now I've got to fix that. Uh, the way I decided to do this was basically just to convert the eyes, like turn off the body so I have the eyes doing what I want, and then I just switch them into world space. So then when I put the body back on, the eyes are now doing their animation, but they're no longer following the head. Like they're not stuck to the face like they were before. Now they just they just live in world space and so the body can move around and the eyes will keep looking at the spot. So then I, I do a little bit of blending to have it kind of influenced, so it's not like too separate. Anyways, this is a pretty easy process if you understand how the tool works and how you can use Unreal to do this in like five clicks. This is one of those things that when you're working with motion capture and you have like root motion, like, like treadmill walking versus walking through space and you need to like convert and stuff, this is literally like four clicks instead of Unreal Engine. It's crazy. Again, stuff that I show in my Unreal for Animation class, if this is stuff that you do for work or you wanna be able to do for a demo reel or for your next job opportunity, join my class. Seriously, I will show you all of this. It's so cool. And finally, that's the workflow. Let me show you the comparisons, where we started to where we got. The original audio just pumped into Unreal. This is what we've got. Be silent. Give your full tongue behind your teeth. I have not passed so far in death to bandy crooked words with a witless worm. Obviously the eyes are doing a lot of stuff. The, the emotion was not intense enough, but also I felt like there was too much going on. There was too much blinking, things like that. I wanted to strengthen the character, so I had to get rid of all that. It's also just hard to tell what this is gonna look like on this character. So I've named him Grandolf for this animation. Be silent. Keep your full tongue behind your teeth. I have not passed so far in death to bandy crooked words with a witless worm. Now you can see the, the comparison a little bit better, right? You can, you can see how the blinking is working against me, right? How the eyes are not conveying the right intensity of emotion. They seem almost sad at the end. He seems just like he's just staring into space when he delivers the beginning of the lines. And the whole like witless worm at the very end. Witless worm. It doesn't have it doesn't have the juice. Like it just not, doesn't have that zest that we need so much. One of the big things I did was I limited how much motion the top lip had so that it wouldn't say witless worm. Like I didn't want it to be this whole mouth operation. The original reference clip, he doesn't move his top lip much. He uses his bottom lip. He like lowers his jaws, it's witless worm. Like he's very stiff on the upper lip. So I tried to bring a little bit more of that. And the one last thing, and this was through my layer workflow, when it says, keep your forked tongue behind your teeth. Like it's very aggressive, but controlled. Keep your forked tongue behind your teeth. Like there's so much like grah in that line. It felt really weird having a big mouth. Keep your forked tongue behind your teeth. Like it was too big. I basically turned down the intensity of all of the animation so that by the end, I think it's like 20%. Not teeth, but teeth. A tightness in the face, in the lower face. And then from there, I could make other adjustments to you know pull the corners more, add more. I, that's where I added a lot of that like neck aggressive stuff. So it was like teeth, teeth. So that this didn't move much, but there was a lot of like muscle and energy behind the line. But this is how I used all these different steps of the workflow to accomplish what you saw on screen. I'm hoping that when you watch this finished animation, it doesn't feel like a metahuman, it doesn't feel like a 3D character like driven off of an audio file or something, even if it's different from the original source material, I want that to feel real. Hopefully I did an okay job. Let me know in the comments. Let me know what you thought of this video and uh, a link down below to my course where I'll teach you how to do all this stuff and more. But as always, I hope you enjoyed. I'm Sir Wade. Thank you so much for watching. A huge thanks to Dell and NVIDIA for sponsoring this video and I'll see you in the next video. Yes. Be silent. Keep your full tongue behind your teeth. I have not passed so far in death to bandy crooked words with a witless worm.